AM 1460, the new WXBR. You are listening to the Metro South Morning Show. Peter Zimbor here with you on this Wednesday morning, this Friday night at the Wilbur Theater. Performing is a comedian who has been seen on countless TV variety shows and television specials over the years. It's the amazing Jonathan, and he joins us right now via the telephone to discuss. Jonathan, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing excellent. You're out in Las Vegas Good. right now, as I understand, a little bit earlier in Las Vegas than it is here in Boston. What's the weather like in Nevada? It, uh, it is nice today. I haven't been out, but it's very, very nice. Um, it's been great. It's starting to get uh, summertime here. So I go up and wash my car when I'm done with this. Yeah, we just were in Orlando, so... Uh, then we have Boston, and then we have one more city to go, and then but that's it. So Nevada is the home base for you, but you do travel all around the country throughout the year doing off sh- doing off shows. Though you have performed at Vegas casinos with residencies and whatnot over the years, correct? Yeah, and it's, this is that thirteen years we went out um, to fill in for David Brenner for two weeks, and then it ended up being a thirteen year gig. Now where you where you held from? Over. Where are you originally from? Because you reside in Nevada I'm originally now. from Detroit. Now, being from Detroit, making the move to Nevada, I've often told people that Nevada, Las Vegas in particular, is the place where I would most like to live in this world, and I get kind of shunned for that. I would want to live there for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. What do you think about living in Las Vegas? Once you get off the Strip, it actually is a normal place to live, people don't realize. Well, yeah, when you're from Detroit, um, it seems normal. I mean, Detroit's a great town if you're a bullet. But uh, Las Vegas is great. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a tons of things to do here. Everything's open late. Uh, you got, as an entertainer, I've got other entertainers coming in, coming and going through town all the time. And uh, like you said, when you step outside of the Strip, you got areas that are green and parks i live in green valley which has you know front lawns and it's trees you'd never know you were in the desert um then there's summerlin which is the other rich part of town but that's all that's all deserty looking so it depends on what what you want See, I had friends that lived in North Las Vegas and Henderson, and I thought it was a perfectly fine place to live the knock on vegas it seems to be from a lot of people is you can't raise kids there your response yeah, I, well, I live in Henderson. That's where Green Valley is in Henderson. Okay. And there's plenty of kids. Uh, there's a lot of kids. This is a regular neighborhood. You know, there's people on skateboards and bicycles. And, and yeah, you can, raise, you can raise kids here. Las Vegas isn't what people think it is. I mean, if you live here, you don't even see the gambling tables anymore. You know, it's just, you know, you walk right by that stuff without even thinking twice about it. Uh, the schools are I have a kid, a 13-year-old, and... and, and and she goes to a great school, and the bus picks her up out in front, just like a normal neighborhood. Vegas uh, is just a city with a lot of beautiful lights. When you look at it from a distance, it's beautiful. And when you're in there, you can... where in other city can you see the Eiffel Tower? Can you see New York skyline? Can you see all the a volcano? You know, there's a this is like a feast, you know. In what other city can you play a slot machine while waiting for them to fill your prescription at CVS? Las Vegas. Would you, would you say say that again? What other city could you possibly kill time waiting for them to fill your prescription at CVS other than by playing for a slot machine? But Las Vegas. That's right. There's a slot machine in restrooms. You can go to the restroom and there's a slot machine. Yeah, you can kill time if if you if you want to take the gambling aspect of it. I just you know I I don't even see the tables anymore. I, I don't even you know hear the bells. It's just like you tune that stuff out. But there's a million things to do, even for kids. Once again, we're chatting with the amazing Jonathan here on AM 1460, the new WXBR, performing Friday night at the Wilbur Theater in Boston. I described you in my entry to this interview that you were both a comedian and a magician. Over the years, you've been able to be a little bit versatile with that title. You've been able to perform with both comedians and magicians. Who do you identify more with and why? Um, I probably identify more with comedians, but I, I hang out more with magicians. A lot of my friends are magicians. I, I like to hang out with them. And, uh, but, but comedians, uh, I don't know. I, I, they're, you know, when, when you have a certain amount of wit, you want to be around other people who have that same kind of wit, you know, sarcasm, whatever you call it. Uh, 
people that are really, really funny. So um, that keeps you sharp when you do that, you know. Uh, magicians aren't the sharpest and wittiest, but they, they, they're fun to hang out with because uh, they sit around and do tricks, and I, I love that, you know. Uh, so I, I'm right in the middle on that one. I, I, you know, that's why I, I think that I've been so successful is that that uh, I found that perfect blend of magic and comedy, and uh, so I, I, I'm, I get to play with both with both parties. It's like being in high school. You, know, you pick the drama people or you pick the jocks, and I was right in the middle there too. So I get to play with both. Um, now I have to keep the peace. A lot of times, there's a lot of magicians. Uh, who hate each other, and uh, here in Vegas they have a competition thing going, and I try to keep the peace there. Uh, what, what magicians and, hate each other in Las Vegas? Well, like 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 Chris Angel is is competing with David Copperfield, and 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 they you know they are always if you're friends with one, you're not friends with the other, you know. So really, uh, David Copperfield and Chris Angel have a blood feud going that strong that they don't associate with those who associate with the other. Yeah, man, they don't. I mean, I don't. I didn't hear from David for a long time, and I figured out why, and that's because I was hanging out with Chris, and I asked him, and he said, "Yeah, that's what it was." And because I mean, eh, Chris is kind of, uh, you know, the the old guy doesn't want to give up the throne to the new guy, uh, nor should he, because Copperfield's great still. He's he hasn't lost any. He hasn't lost his touch. But you know, Chris comes to town, and he's magician of the year, magician of the century, magician, you know, any title that can be bought, um, that's what, that's what happens, you know, so there's a competition going there, and I try to get them together to be friends, but there's no way in hell that that's going to happen, and then Penn and Teller, um, uh, you know, Penn, Penn doesn't like anyone who's religious, and and, and Chris is religious, and it's, it's just, uh, see, I, I find that interesting, because I remember seeing Penn and Teller on Chris Angel's TV show in A and E years ago, but it does seem like Penn Jillette tends to be critical of Chris Angel in a lot of interviews and things of that nature. He very, he very much is, and and he liked Chris at first. He had Chris on his podcast, and they were friends. But then Chris started wearing crosses and 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 putting big uh, religious artifacts in his house, and he went Christian, and and then Penn can't stomach that, you know. Uh, he just doesn't have patience for people that are like that, and uh, that's. I think that's what it was that that caused that feud. But uh, I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm neutral. I'm right in between, so I can hang out with with both of them, and and, and with the exception of with Copperfield and Chris. But uh, I put I, I pick Copperfield over Chris, so. So, you, so you you think that David Copperfield is a better magician than Chris Angel, or someone uh, you like to hang out with more? No, I I don't know if he's a. You know what? He's probably a better magician than. Neither one of them are are, are magically are, are like technically uh, skillful. Like a, like a lot of the magicians I hang out with are great, but they're more of like David Copperfield's more of a storyteller and with the illusions. And Chris works his ass off. They're both. They're both worthy of the money they make. Let's put it that way. They both make millions and millions of dollars a year, and, and they earn every penny of it. But Chris is always working, and David's always working. And But David's been around a long time, so you know what? He deserves the respect, and Chris isn't giving it to him. You know, you got to give respect to someone like David Copperfield, who's been around for 30, 30 years making making magic. See, I you saw know? Chris Angel's stage show at the Luxor in Las Vegas, and I personally found the show to be perplexing. He seemed to do the same trick where he disappears behind a sheet over and over again, interspersed with, like, six-foot-tall dancing rabbits. And then at the end of the show, he says, do you want to see one more trick? And does the same trick again, then it's over. I, I really didn't Okay, you it. saw, you must have seen it when Circus Soleil had their fingers in the pot. Yes, I did. Because everybody gave it a bad review. Everybody hated it because it wasn't anything like Mind Freak. There was a circus. They had dancers and rabbits dancing. Chris put his foot down and and took the show over. And kind of, he didn't kick Circus Soleil out because it's their money bankrolling the whole thing. But uh, they were so desperate that they let Chris take the show over. And he turned it into a, a, a real magic show uh, within the last, uh, few years, the show has gotten to be very, very, very good now that he's got his hand in it. He didn't have much control at first, you know? 
I'm glad to hear that because I saw 3,000 people leaving the theater kind of looking at each other. So was it just yeah. that suck? And they were like, that totally sucked. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people came away uh, doing that. And and Chris was tired of it because it wasn't his fault. You know, it was Cirque du Soleil's fault. And, and uh, he took over and, and worked his butt off and made it into a into more like a mind freak, what people want to see. People love mind freak is what just made him famous, you know. Once again, we're chatting with the amazing Jonathan Comedian and Magician here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. When a comedian does poorly, you know it's happening because they bomb and no one laughs. When a magician uh, messes up, I suppose they can try to hide it to some degree unless they just colossally screw up the entire trick and the trick is let loose and the audience can see exactly what they're doing. What are some horror stories you have from both the comedy world and the magic world, either from firsthand experience yourself or others you've seen? Well, I'll tell you what, when I screw up uh, a trick, uh, people think that it's planned because I've, 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 I'm a comic magician. So uh, I've got that advantage of being able to uh, make people think that it really was supposed to happen that way when it wasn't. Um, but when I was doing magic seriously, um, I'll tell you, the last show I did was at my high school talent show. And... Uh, it was in front of everybody I knew, including my parents, my relatives, all my peers. Uh, and I did six tricks, and all of them went horribly wrong. They all mal- malfunctioned. Um, and it was probably the biggest disaster show you could ever imagine. And I killed a dove. Um, <laughs> the girl the girl in the sword box had a leg cramp, and she said, I have to get out now. And she got out knock the box apart, you know, you know, that ruined that trick. And I exposed the levitation, uh, everything went wrong. And, um, after the show, I just knew that that was the last magic show I, I, I will ever had ever do. So it was too, I never did another serious magic show after that night. Um, I mean, it was so bad that the next day in school, the kids didn't tease me. They just didn't say anything to me. That's even worse, you know. So that was the last serious magic show I ever did. And and from from that point on, when I picked picked magic up again, it was comedy magic that I wanted to do. And it's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect because if you screw up, you can just make a joke out of it, and that's the joke. I screwed up, right? Yeah, basically, I'm doing right now. I'm doing the show I did at my high school talent show. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm killing a fake dove. I'm doing, you know, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's much better to get laughs. And and you know, there's a lot of comics who do a little bit of magic. There's a lot of magicians who do a little bit of comedy, but there's no one who does it. Uh, a perfect blend of the two, except for myself and Penn and Teller, and maybe uh, two or three other magicians. Uh, but if you get the right blend, like we found, then you become famous. We became famous. So uh, there's not a lot of competition for me out there because they haven't found that right blend like we have. It seems like, you know, you look at the 90s into the early 2000s. Uh, the big stage for a magician to have was a network special and usually a network special that sort of centered around one big stunt, if not a traditional magic trick. David Copperfield had those events. Uh, David Blaine had those events. And then that sort of went away. Chris Angel had the Mind Freak TV show in A&E, which was successful for a few years. And now it seems like the most successful magicians are – you know, innately magicians, but they sort of get their word out there by doing other things. Penn and T- Teller uh, discuss politics and libertarian viewpoints on their uh, Showtime TV show and things of that nature. What avenues are there out there for magicians right now to get their point across and to get, you know, promote themselves? Um, it's not easy to have. There's not, I mean, Penn is really uh, high up the ladder with the atheist thing. Um, you know, he tours with Richard Dawkins, and, and, and I just saw the lecture this, this week. Uh, uh, it's pretty amazing what Penn, Penn can, uh, you know, what Penn does is amazing. He's on every TV show there is. He's been on the, the Trump show. He's been on, the, you know, a cooking show. He's been on every show he can get on, he gets on. And that really perpetuates business for him in Vegas, him and Penn. And now, and then uh, Teller has plays going on in New York. He has a play going on here. So they keep busy with other things, which enables them to keep their draw with their magic show. 
but I mean, there's not a lot of magicians who have the uh, the smarts that Penn has, and the, and the, in, you know, like Copperfield doesn't do TV specials hardly anymore. You never see a Copperfield special anymore. Um, I, I I don't know. I think that it's it's uh, it's hard to be any. You shouldn't really have to do that stuff to, to support your, the magic, but you do. You know, I, like I don't have a point to make. Therefore, I, you know, Comedy Central, Comedy Central throw me a special every once in a while, but it's nothing to do with anything but my skill as a magician and a comedian. You know, the reason I ask I, is because you look at the different avenues that. Uh, different opportunities that magicians have. I don't think any magician has really risen to prominence in, say, the Internet age. I mean, there's been guys who are around beforehand that have, you know, added to their aura, like Penn and Teller, for example. But there's really been no one coming up that's like the new magician that people are talking about that will Well, have to be Chris special. Angel was the closest thing to that. I mean, he, Mind, Freak, Mind Freak set everybody on their on their ear, you know. But you're right. There's only it seems like there's only one magician popular at one 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 at a time. It seems like, I mean, there's a million rock bands that can be popular, but there's only room for one magician who stands out as the king of magic. Uh, you know, it was you know back then it was Doug Henning, and then 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 it was Copperfield, and then it was Chris Angel, and uh, they're just waiting for the new the new one. You know, there's only seems to be room for one. Once again, we're chatting with the amazing Jonathan here on AM 1460, the new WXBR, performing Friday night at the Wilbur Theater in Boston. Jonathan, you are sort of on the tail end of your live performing magic and comedy career. Explain to us why it seems that you're looking towards retirement in the near future. Okay, I just did uh, 13 years in in Vegas, and um, then I just got really, really tired of the way the casinos we're, we're, we're treating all the acts, not just myself. They just don't care anymore out here, uh, about the entertainer. Like they did, they did in the day when Steve Wynn, you know, owned, owned the casinos and they, they pampered the entertainers. And now, uh, now they don't care about the entertainers anymore. We're just basically their landlords and you rent a room, you know, you, they used to give you the showroom and now, they used to pay. I find this interesting you. right now. You, you're telling me that there are magicians out there renting the rooms from casinos in Las Vegas to perform because what I always thought was that they would be giving a fee to perform to entice people to come in. And even if. Nope. The, yeah, nope. Not even, anymore. Even if the casino lost on ticket sales for the show, they'd make it up at the gaming tables. That was the thought That's process, right. right? That's right. They used to just, just count on the, the acts to bring in the right demographic. And they used to pay them a fortune. Uh, Siegfried and Roy made millions a year. Uh, not even Copperfield now. And nobody makes a salary. Nobody is paid by a casino anymore. What happens is this. The room is available. You rent the room out of your own pocket. You pay for the advertising. All, all the billboards come out of your own money. Uh, you have to have a fortune to come here to open a show, to have the capital to open a show. Um they don't pay anyone. It's it's called a four. There's a two deals. There's a three wall deal and a four wall deal. Three wall deal is they take part of the expense of they advertise for you. You pay the you pay the rent. They do some advertising and they split the money with you at the door. That's really rare. Most of the deals are you have to pay all. The, like a room would cost anywhere from five five thousand a week to to twenty thousand a week. Uh, and you pay that to the casino. They're just landlords, and you do your own advertising, and and you you take the money that comes in. But um, and they treat you like shit now too, because it, I mean, let's put it this way: I, I, I've been out here for 13 years, and I've played four different casinos, uh, <clears throat> and each one of them tried to screw me in their own way. One of them went as far as hiding cameras in my dressing room and watch to watch the girls getting changed. You know, that's the kind of mentality it is. So hold, hold, let's stop right there, because magicians have traditionally beautiful female assistants. You're telling me that a casino in Las Vegas put cameras inside your beautiful assistant's dressing room in order to see them change and get naked. And we're talking the president and the vice president, not just some some <clears throat> sleazy stagehand. No, I'm talking, and that, the reason I found out about it, the only reason I found out is because they People who installed the cameras went to the newspaper, and the newspaper called me and asked me 
do you know that there's cameras hidden in your dressing room? And I'm like, no. And sure enough, there were. So uh, we took them to court and we sued the hell out of them and we settled out of court. And the girls got a lot of money for, from that. But I mean, it, that leaves, that's the kind of stuff that they do. They think that they live in their own little world and nothing can touch their, their little world. You know, they're, they're the king of this, but, but, uh, yeah, they just, they just treat everybody with, you, you can play someone for six years and you think everyone's your best friend and, and, and then some, you do something that they don't like and the business drops off a little, whatever it is. And they turn their back on you like a bunch of snakes and, and you're out, you know, like Lance Burton after, after, I think Lance was here for 25 years, 20 years, and that they they screwed him out. And um, I uh, I got tired of it, so I I went to my own theater. I got a theater that wasn't inside of a casino for the last five years and played there. Uh, and then I decided to go on the road. And then a year into the road, I was diagnosed with a heart failure condition. I got I got heart failure. And so now. Um, I announced my farewell tour, so um, I can't I can't do the road anymore because my uh, heart's slowly dying and I'm on me. So um, I, I'm doing a weekend here or there, and then my last Boston will be my next to last date uh, that I do forever. I do from Boston, I go to Toledo, and then I'm finished. So you're saying this is not like the Kiss farewell tour that happened 13 years ago, and they'll be hitting the road with Def Leppard this summer. This is it. No, this this is going to be. Yeah, this is it. I don't have a choice. If I, you know, if I could could go on, I would go on, but I can't. So um, it's getting harder for me to do things because of the oxygen is not being fed to my extremities. My legs are freezing up on me. My hands are freezing up on me. And, uh, I did San Diego a couple of weeks ago, and, and I almost didn't make it through a show uh, for the very first time. And then uh, I just got back from Orlando this weekend, and uh, you know, I was fine. Nothing happened. But, you know, I can see where where um, if things don't get better, that I'm not going to be able to do the show physically anymore, you know. Well, we encourage the folks to check you out this Friday at the Wilbur Theater in Boston. It's the amazing Jonathan. Jonathan, before I let you go, what advice would you give some aspiring entertainers as they look to get to the entertainment field circa 2014? Take care of your heart. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, um, aspiring, I, I would just say, you know, the, the, the only thing that, here's the whole key to the whole deal. Somebody told me this a long time ago. As long as you keep writing new material and keep working on your act, everything else happens by itself. All the doors will open for you naturally if you just do that. You'll have an agent, you'll get an agent, you'll get TV work, and, you know. Just keep it keep it fresh and keep it, you know, keep it fun, make it look like it's fun even if you're not having fun, you know. Just just work on your act. One other the thing original. That, one other thing I want to ask you before we let you go is that one thing that we didn't speak about with the advent of the internet and the rise of internet and uh, magic, you know, being a part of pop culture as it is today, is a lot of magicians are selling their tricks online. So a lot of tricks that in yesteryear would have been kept a secret, now people can, for a fee, find out how they're done. What are your thoughts on that? And is there any trick? I think it's great. You think it's great? Okay, there you go. I do. I think it's great because, I mean, uh, uh, it's, learning a magic trick is nothing... Well, who cares if somebody knows the secret of a magic trick? I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, what does it matter? I mean, um, that's how you learn how to do magic, by watching somebody do it. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't have the Internet. We had to read instructions from a book that we got uh, from a library or whatever. And that's really hard to do because to read magic instructions is a nightmare. You know, it's like put your left forefinger underneath the right palm and turn your right hand over and put your thumb, you know, it's like impossible to learn. Uh, so the internet, you got somebody showing you how to do the trick is beautiful. And you can almost learn any trick that you want to learn on the internet. So with you having just two more shows left in your magic career, what is one trick that is easy to do, but impressive to the eye uh, that someone can learn that you can tell us right here on the radio? Um, Okay, this was Houdini's very favorite magic trick, and I love this trick. If you take uh, a napkin, this is a great dinner table trick, and put, like, say, the salt shaker or any object underneath the napkin, 
uh, and say you're going to make it disappear, and then you have everybody reach under the net in the field to make sure the salt shaker is still underneath. Yep, everyone reaches under and feels. The last person who reaches under to feel if it's still there is in on the trick. They steal it away from underneath, and then you just take it like you still have it underneath the handkerchief and make it, boom, it's vanished. Show both sides of the soaked handkerchief, you know, and it's gone. Nobody knows where the hell it went because nobody suspects that that last person was in on the trick and that they stole it from underneath the napkin. It's beautiful. That, that, that's a good one. Another good trick for the dinner table or lunch table or the breakfast table, if you will, but it's a bit more messy. I did this at my elementary school talent show, Jonathan. You take a creamer you know, one of those little creamers, and yes, you get right. up and you, you rub your eye and say, excuse me, uh, my eye is bothering you. Then you take a fork, jam it into your eye, and the cream goes splattering out, and people scream, and then you, you know, blink and go, oh, Yes, it it's very eye. good. I, I do that one myself all the time. You can also fill your mouth with water when nobody's looking and uh, pretend like you have a sinus problem by, by holding your nose back and forth, and then rub your arm down, rub your arm across your nose like you're white, rubbing your your nose on your sleeve and let the water out at the same time. And then they think it's coming from your, your nose, not your mouth. Very, very good. Well, it's Jonathan. It's tricks like that. Why people should come out this Friday at the Wilbur theater in Boston. That's on Tremont street, right near Emerson college. Uh, any final words for our listeners before I let you go this morning? Yeah. Well, come out and see it. It's going to be your last chance to see me live. If you've seen the show before, there's new stuff in the show I put in. Uh, and the show is still as good as ever. I mean, the show is, more laughs per minute than any other show out there. So come say hi. That's the amazing. Oh, and, and bye. That's the amazing Jonathan on his farewell tour. This Friday it hits the Wilbur Theater in Boston. Jonathan, thank you. All right, man. You're listening to AM 1460, the new WXBR. We'll step aside. Mike Pava fills us in with a local news update. Stay with us.